Thank you for the beautiful invitation. Namo tasa bhagavato harahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato Arahato Samma Samputa Sa Tamang Sang Putang Tamang Sangam Namasam Reading the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. So I come, I thought we were thinking it would be a smaller group. It's still pretty big. <laughs> I know some are down at uh, the uh, the robes offering um, in Oregon, so we can know that they're sharing merits back up here, probably with the community, and we can also share merits of our time together with the auspicious occasion of sharing robes with the bhikkhus of the Pacific Hermitage. And so I'm here today as a student, a student of the Buddha, uh, I've been practicing since before putting on robes, but actually a lot of my Buddhist life has been in robes. Um, it was pretty quick for me to, like, oh, wow, is this possible? I'm all in. <laughs> so it was uh, not too long. And I know that many of you here have been practicing for even longer than I've been in robes. And many of you here have been going as deep or deeper or tangentially or, you know, somewhere in, in Dhamma land. So let's have a wonderful exploration together. At the coffee shop beforehand, there were a few of us talking, so I know there's a lot of rich possibilities for conversation here. Okay, so I was here about a month ago. And I was talking about responsibility, the ability to respond, not so much about the, um, you're a responsible person, but more about how we can be a responsible person, how we can have the capacity, the resilience to respond the capacity to be present with what is. And as I, during that time, I read several suttas, which unfortunately I didn't bring the cheat sheet from last time with the wonderful definitions and, and the references for the suttas. But I'd said, you know, I could spend a month unpacking those suttas. Well, I think over the last month I could tell you I could spend a year unpacking those suttas. And after a year, I might tell you I could spend a decade unpacking those suttas. So it also led me into some new territory that we might touch on today. One of the phrases that came up as I was looking at responsibility and some of the synonyms, duty, our obligations, and looking at the suttas where these words came up was a phrase that translated by, um, um, where does he go, Ajahn? Az Ajahn Su, uh, Sujato, uh, his translation is not slacking off. Don't be a slacker. Uh, if, you're, if you're going to be practicing with energy in the Buddhist path, don't be a slacker. Not slacking off. And so with some determination, I went through those phrases and, and looked them up to see what does that mean in my practice, to not be a slacker, to not slack off. And the phrase, the, the set of words that it often is packaged around, I'm going to read, uh, the power of energy. It's when a noble disciple lives with energy roused up for the giving up of unskillful qualities in the embracing skillful qualities. They're strong, staunchly vigorous, not slacking off when it comes to developing skillful qualities. And it's that phrase, not slacking off, 
when it comes to developing skillful qualities that I pursued you know, throughout the suttas. Uh, I've got a whole list of them here, but we'll only touch on a few. Not slacking off. Well, to me, that felt like I had to you know, bring up this energy, this virya, and go for the goal. And as I was practicing with that, I wasn't feeling like I was getting, it, it says it, that this leads to mindfulness and this leads to samadhi. And I wasn't experiencing that my not slacking was doing that. And also, I mentioned Enkem and Defo at the beginning of this. I, I just did a, a workshop that uh, she led. And she introduced this diagram called a vent diagram. Not then, but vent diagram, which looks like a Venn diagram. Uh, but it's, it's a thing out there you can find on the internet, vent diagram. She didn't in, invent this one, but finds it very useful. And it's about apparent contradictions. So not slacking off. Well, relax. Is that a contradiction? Or is it the same thing in support? So these diagrams give things that maybe are contradictory or maybe are completely supportive. So this is what I started practicing with, was relaxation as my form of not slacking off. It works. <laughs> I found it amazing. So my not slacking off started to look like I must also say that I've been having this sciatic pain. And so the more not slacking off looked tight, the more it looked like tension and not leading to depths of letting go. So I started working with relax. And that sent me back to when I was asking advice of... Um, Venerable uh, Chachama Tenzin Palmo had the opportunity. I was either a novice or a new bhikkhuni. Uh, I'm not timeline right around that time of becoming either just about to or had just become a bhikkhuni. And so I, I, I'm pretty sure I had just become a bhikkhuni uh, within that first year. And I was all nervous and I wanted some advice and I finally went up and asked for some advice, and she took me and looked me in the eye, and she said, sweetheart, relax. So that was her advice for monastic life, and I think it's the advice for the path. What does it look like to not be slacking off, to be really energetic? For me, relax. So where do you go when you want teachings about relaxation? Come on. Australia, Bhikkhu, nobody? Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> uh, and if you, if you search YouTube, you'll find um, Ajahn Brahm and relax. You can... Yeah, basically just about every Ajahn Brahm talk will come up. <laughs> so I found one in particular that I listened to, and the title of it was Relax. <laughs> and there was some amazing advice in there that to relax in this present moment is the best preparation for the future. And when you learn to relax, you become incredibly resilient. And some of the tension is the pull of the future against the hook of the past. And so I took these tidbits from Ajahn Brahm and I began to apply them as I looked at the suttas which I'd been trying to hold 
tightly and practice perfectly. And I found instead that if I read them in a very relaxed mind, I was happier and my meditation was deeper. So I'm going to open this up pretty soon um, because I really want this to be an exploration of, of this apparent tension of relaxation and not slacking off energy. So here's a sutta. Uh, last time I, I mentioned a sutta um, in, called In Brief, a teaching in brief, and this was in response to somebody's question about um, um, uh, disappointing people with their responsibility. You know, that if they, if they looked at their responsibility and they stayed in their own space of what they should be responsible for and they didn't go try to do it all, they were disappointing. And I told uh, a story about how I was at a monastery and had a difficulty with someone and then I went to work with it and I took responsibility for my actions. And this came from, I, I turned to this particular sutta, a teaching in brief from the Anguttara Nikaya 863, which was to cultivate a heart of love. And that the cultivating the heart of love was what allowed me to be resourced to meet the, the conflict. It allowed me to be resourced to take responsibility and I didn't end up having a conversation with that person about the incident for many months because I turned inward and took responsibility for it. So I just brought a, a collection of those things today to say how do I relax? How do I relax and take responsibility? How do I relax and not slack off? And I do that by cultivation, cultivation of the wholesome, which was from the, the sutta I read before. And this was the cultivation I did. My heart will inwardly steady and well settle. No erring, unskillful conditioning arisen in the mind takes hold and remains. So this is not saying that those states don't come up. It's, it's saying they don't remain in the mind. That I use my skill to soften and cultivate the wholesome. I develop love as deliverance of heart. I earnestly practice, master, make a foundation, experience, accumulate, and well undertake it. So that's the virya. That's the not slacking off. And what am I not slacking off into? Relaxation. For me, this has been super, super powerful. So from a teaching in brief, one of the first suttas I came up with when looking further into this area of, of energy and not slacking off was one called in detail. So we're going from in brief to in detail. And this is one that goes through the five powers, which includes faith, energy, mindfulness, samadhi, immersion, and wisdom. So in the, uh, the second one in there, the energy, is where we get that phrase of the not slacking off when it comes to developing skillful qualities. And the pattern I noticed from this sutta, which is Ang excuse me, Anguttara Nikaya 514, and about a dozen other ones, was that this energy, not slacking off, was in the context of already having some faith. So we've already got, which is the chant we did around the Buddha. So a lot of these have that itipiso bhagava arhang, the qualities of the Buddha, they bring up this energy, so it's a natural unfolding. This is, we're talking something a little bit different than right effort now. This is an energy that's arising. The not slacking off comes from the fact that we have some confidence. And where does it lead? It ends up kind of picking up the qualities of mindfulness, the qualities of mindfulness 
that help us to stay on target, to, to be attentive, to be curious, to look at things. And when it's merged with these qualities, it leads to the stillness. So I'm not efforting my way into the stillness. I'm relaxing into it from this basis of energy that came out of the faith that was buoyed further by the mindfulness. And what I'm finding is that that's what quiets the mind, makes it still, makes it spacious, makes it still attentive, not, not relaxed and dull, like I'm going to drool on my pillow kind of thing, but more a relaxation that makes me wide awake, really attentive in a way that is sustainable, that's soft. Um, I could pull in some more suttas, but I think I'd really rather start the conversation because I know uh, from several people already this morning and uh, some conversations I had back on the, uh, the island that there's a lot out there around this, this not slacking off relaxation realm when we're talking about responsibility and our ability to respond. So would anybody in the room or online like to bring in other suttas or your experience or your questions or comments? Thank you, Aya. I just wanted to say that, so when you first, um, when you were first talking about what you were going to talk about, and you talked about, you said, you know, not slacking off in practice and all that, I had this, like, just rush of guilt and tightness and my whole being contracted. Like I was, my eyes welled up with tears. And I felt like, you know, I could feel like, oh, yes, I've, that's what I've been doing. And just this deluge of gross feelings. And then you brought in the other half. And my whole being just sighed, right? I could just feel it loosen. And I was like, oh, and you know, in my, so things have been a little bit difficult. There's been a lot of sort of reactivity and I've been avoiding practice. Like, and then feeling all of that, like I just guilt and whatever, but like I, you know, I like see the cushion and I just feel all that tightness. Like I don't wanna sit in that. Like it's so hard and my, my brains are both like, mushy and contracted and whatever. And then when you said that, I was just like, oh, it's just because that, whatever that is, I'm so excited <laughs> to explore that. And I know it in different ways, right? And I just didn't see that that's how I was holding it. And I'm really excited to hear what everyone else has to say because like I had a very visceral, I was like whoosh and wah. So, that's amazing. That's all I wanted to say. There. Yeah, your languaging on that is, is somatic. It's, it's very, very valuable. And that's why I did the, the guided meditation to really be this, see what is the resiliency level right now, and then watch as we language. You must be responsible. Okay, don't slack off. Don't be a slacker. Wah! Was that the, the right word? Wah! <laughs> and then, you know, to still be directed and relax. I automatically take a breath. And then there's much more space for me to show up. And I'd love to hear other people's reactions and what might be the pitfalls, and how do we address them? Think, yes, Mary?
Okay, thank you. Hello, Aya. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry it took a while to unmute. Um, thank you for so much for this talk. It is right on my mind right now. I have um, my thinking. My thinking this week has been how goal directed everything is. This responsibility has been a factor all my life, and. I have been realizing, I don't know how many goals I set, like even I'm going to sit for 45 minutes, rather than sitting with the pleasure of sitting and just seeing how long it will take, you know, how long the meditation lasts. What I've been recognizing is that so much of this must be done is ego driven and is this assumption I have so this week I've decided I'm giving up goals. And now you speak about relaxation. So, so in sync, I'm so grateful for that. Um, the inkling that I have had is, was touched on when you talked about faith, because it seems to me that to really relax, there is a surrender to it. There is this surrender of just trusting the Dharma and trusting the Dharma to um, grow within, to, to uh, speak in its softer tones about what's appropriate, the appropriate response. I'm going around because you, this talk just hit exactly where I was. And I wanna thank you for that. But I do think that the big transition here is a transition from ego to relaxation on faith and relaxing into faith to see. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Aya, for your presence. Thank you, Mary. Uh, the, what you're bringing up is, is sparking something in me too. It's very rich. Uh, that aspect of the ego and how supportive the faith is in making it safe enough for us to set the ego aside a little bit or put it down or you know just not let it be running the show um i hadn't quite considered how that aspect of confidence and faith makes it possible for us to do our striving in a way that's relaxed and not controlled so thank you very much for bringing that into the context of this this conversation. Who's got the mic? I've got a few images that I could share. Uh, when I began meditating, it was in the Korean Zen tradition, and they call a retreat kilche, which they would translate as to sit like a tiger watching his prey. And, uh, or you could imagine a, a cat watching a mouse hole. So to be very still, but also very attentive. And a couple of other images I've come across is like a, a runner at the starting line who can't be tense, but he's very attentive and ready to go. Or a, uh, like a hawk on the wind who can be perfectly still, even though they're making adjustments in order to find that stillness. Those are powerful imageries that I think really says how we do this. You know, how is it that we're not slacking off and we are relaxed? I don't think I've, you know, the cat, um, now, that's not the form of mindfulness we're aiming for, you know, jumping on a prey. It's not it. And, <laughs> and there is something really valuable we can learn from that image. Uh, cats don't waste their energy. And they're attentive. And they're kind of attentive in this lazy kind of way until they're ready to act. 
So that's a, a nice image. And uh, the runner in particular also strikes me. I'm, I am definitely not a runner. And I know from those I've talked to who do running and the other kinds of activities I do, that to be optimal in performance, we need to be relaxed, available to put the right amount of energy out. And so that, that aspect of the balance. Uh, Ajahn Brahm talks also about if you want to be productive, then relax. I found this very true as I was moving towards uh, renunciant life and I was still in the workforce and I was starting to put some boundaries on my work life. One of them was no lunch meetings. You know, that, that I was going to have lunch either alone completely mindfully or with others and off of the topics of work and still trying to be engaged with I am eating. I was starting to move into the eight precepts. And you know, so that was my part of my, my practice. And at first my coworkers were like, we're not gonna, you know, we need to have those lunch meetings. We need, you know, that's when we can get together. We need to make these decisions. And the, like, nope. You know, I was knowing that I was going to a monastery. I had, you know, the capacity to <laughs> boundaries. I'm, you know, he can't ha ha ha. You can't push me around on this anymore. And so it was a gift because my coworkers started joining me at lunch because they needed me in the meeting that I wasn't willing to attend at that time. We got more productive as a team because we took some time to relax. So it can be very, very supportive if we know that by doing this relaxation either before or during that we are actually improving our performance. Um, and I'm going to be visiting Korea for a month and I'm going to have some conversations with you afterwards once I've been immersed in it to see you know, what I learned from that side too. So others or, or follow up? Okay. Yeah, that was really helpful. I had, I, it's funny because this has been on my mind, but I didn't realize it was on my mind. And last night I had a dream um, with Ajahn Jeff in it, actually. <laughs> and we were, like everyone was w watching um, how relaxed he was and like every single finger and toe was relaxed and that was actually helping him, um, which is just totally random. But <laughs> it's it's on my mind and I've been realizing like the more I've been meditating lately the the striving is starting to come in and it's just something that I have to be very vigilant about and I think one kind of indicator and I and I was wondering too for you what your indicators are I know you talked about the sciatica but like heart indicators of the heart like for me I've been trying to start my meditations out with with metta for myself, wishing myself goodwill, because that's often harder for me. And I was noticing, like, as the weeks were passing, that was getting harder and harder for me. But I think there's something about the relationship between metta and, and relaxation. And for me, if there's too much striving, that can be really, really difficult. So I'm thinking about, like, what are these, what are these signs that I can kind of look out for when I'm getting to that place? And so I can kind of pull my back myself back into the the other side of relaxation a bit more but yeah thank you so much I'm playing with striving and relaxing being synonyms and I'll pull in the meta first I think so the, the metta, and particularly the metta for the parts of me that are hard to be with or have something to say and I haven't wanted to listen or um, aren't too keen on getting on the cushion. Um, sometimes I, I do the metta for those parts when I'm not on the cushion because they're kind of aversive to the cushion. So I start my metta practice for myself 
sometimes in a very relaxed kind of way. You know, some of them are those, I've, I've heard from psychologists, I don't know if it's true or not, but you know, if you've got a little boy and you want to um, have a conversation, it needs to be while playing. You know, if you want to have a, have a conversation with a little boy. So there's this, this part that has that kind of flavor in me. And so I will be more playful in my, we're active on something else, um, you know, whether that's a cup of tea or a, uh, arranging or cleaning or, you know, I've got some other activity and I start to sneak the meta in. Sneak the meta in and bring that part in, you know, and say, oh, you know, after we do this, it might be, maybe we go meditate. Um, how, how would, oh, sweetie, how would that be? You know, okay. Um, and so I start doing the meta practice in these creative ways to bring the parts in. And they're like, wow, this is too much. <laughs> Don't throw that meta stuff at me. <laughs> And so bringing meta in where the part, it's like if you were going to have a conversation with a sibling who doesn't want to have that conversation, isn't able to hear your words, or those of you who are parents, your child, yeah, whatever, mom. What would you do for that part, that person? And you do it for that part. You take them out for a cup of coffee. You, you, you go for a walk. You... So bring the metta in off the cushion in a very engaged kind of playful way. And then it's easier to do because that's the part's ready to, to, to be there and be present and actually might go, oh, yeah, okay, you know, all right, just maybe a little hug would be okay. And then over time, they'll put their arm around the part of you that's giving the metta too. It's, so it's that kind of approach. Doing metta just on the cushion as an exercise, it's not relaxed and it's not needing that part. So that part, um, there was another thing. Oh, oh, the striving. So sometime and particularly noticing qualities. So I'll check in, like, what is my energy level before I go to the cushion? And there was somebody visiting me the other day that I said, yeah, sometimes, and I've got this, you've been there, the, the rug that's behind, you know, that my cushion's on is just long enough for a really good pacing. Um, because I'm doing it fast, I can kind of call it pacing, but it doesn't have that mental energy. It's much more just, you know, really moving the body. And so I notice that I'm at the energy level I'm at and I'm attentive, and I'm aware, this, I'm, I'm not lifting and putting down, a, I'm walking, I'm moving, I'm this, and I'll start to slow down a little bit as the body's ready. And then it comes to a point where I'm like, oh goody, let's go to the cushion. So when did I start meditating? Where do I get a log, my, my log book? Relax. <laughs> it all counts. If you are cultivating the wholesome qualities, it all counts. If you need a log, and eventually you'll throw that log away. A response, how is that? OK. <laughs> Others. Sarah, please. Sarah, could you unmute, please? We're not hearing. Is there anything tech support can do to help with the uh, unmuting? Or I, I can't see from this angle what the little mm -hmm. 
It's misbehaving. Excellent. We hear you. Raise my hand. I can't. I can't. Call. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. We're, we are getting audio. Um, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it's choppy. Can you can you start it again again, and we'll see if it if it's solid enough or understandable. Love what you're. I love the talk. Of your helping guide us. The read say something. Helped my practice. It's very static and it's. Uh, can sell both, but and that's me relaxing. I wasn't able to piece probably the the, the nugget out of that. I, I I heard you know the thank you and the uh, but. Uh, wasn't able to did any was anybody else able to piece it together well uh, yes yes please. yes Sarah would you be happy to type what you were the the, the nugget of what you were saying in because we're, we're not able to quite put it together well enough to to be able to reply Well, the typing is happening. We've got someone over here. Great. Yeah, I just wanted to say I think you had mentioned in the guided meditation as well right now about play as an attitude. Um, yeah, that was just something that I found to be really beneficial for me. Um, I think there's like a natural spontaneity to that, and it's like a natural energy as well. So it kind of counterbalances the, the striving too hard because you can't really like try to play. <laughs> You're like setting up the, the rules to play. It's not really play anymore. So, yeah. yeah thank you. It, it is. It's a quality I've been working on. And, and uh, it's a quality I've been playing with. <laughs> and it's exactly that. I, I've been trying to catch myself with the phrase of, well, I'll work on that and change it to, oh, I'll play with that. It's been super helpful. I have a, a teacher... Paul Linden, who really has been emphasizing that he has an online dojo for working with uh, peace, cultivating wholesome qualities and strength to be able to respond to difficulties in, in the world and in ourselves. And uh, whenever anybody of us says, well, I'll work, I'll, I, I've got something to work on, it's like, you've got something to play with. And it's super helpful. So when meditation, it, and I noticed it in my in my comment uh, when I after it's like, oh goody, I get to go meditate now. It's a huge shift. Striving is more become the natural unfolding, uh, which is far more playful. Um, if you if you look at these monastics who have some realization, they're generally not pretty stuck. They're very, very funny, you know, uh, and light and playful. Um, yeah, so I'll leave it with that. So thank you. All right, was it, did you say Daniel? Okay, please, Daniel, online. Unmute, and we'll try verbal. Ah. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm actually asking a question for a friend because she's come to me with this and I just don't know. I can't give her any advice, point her to any suit does really. Um, but I'm going to read what she typed or part of what she typed. Um, she's dealing with a lot of fear. Um, more and more of her nights are populated with intense, amorphous, existential fear. 
like being tossed around in a storm and hoping that someone or some kind of godlike hand will reach out and save her. Um, like having a bad trip sober or feels like she's dying. Um, and she's completely alone in how to deal with this. Can you give any advice or any suggestions on what I can do to help my friend who's experiencing this? Just starting with what you can do is relax. Uh, the more relaxed and centered and balanced and open-hearted that you are, the more space there is for to experience what she's experiencing and for there to be safety. So what you offer is safety for the experience. And for you to do that, I highly recommend the practice of, you know, breathing. I breathe, you know, as if I'm breathing down into the earth below me and up and then out in all the directions. So I've, I've kind of got this spacious flow of, of breathing. And then I'm, I've got a soft body. My belly is soft. My throat is soft. My tongue is soft. So I'm softening. And then my heart is bright and warm. You know, kind of the, the end of the meditation aspect of bringing something that really makes the heart glow and smile. So this is the practice you can hold in order to be the best container of friendship, to hear whatever experience your friend is going through. So with that part, does that, how does that land? Notice, I, no advice giving. No, nodding head, okay, thank you. All right, nodding head, good. <laughs> be looking for advice especially because we're friends online mm -hmm. uh, only so much I can do in terms of my own um, physical behavior to convey that peace and safety online oh, you, it, you'd be surprised if you're in a zoom it will be visible if you are typing in a chat uh, I had someone watching me answer emails at the monastery and they said I love watching you answer emails I'm like what <laughs> because they could see the meta and I do think it comes through in what you type oh that's super useful thank you um, just the screen was tilted so I can see better <laughs> um, and so it will it will support her even if it doesn't support her, it will help you to remain resilient and open and capacitated. So, because listening to these things can be draining or tightening, or so it keeps you soft and available and resourced. So it's good even if it only goes that far. And it's surprising. I, we, we're doing therapy online, we're doing counseling, we're doing movement practice. So much of this body um, um, communication is actually happening. So don't, definitely that. Uh, and then uh, you can share this if it's helpful for her. I was on a retreat, a 30-day retreat in kind of a difficult environment with way too many roommates in a room that didn't have a door that was in squeaky bunk beds and um, the noise of, of, of all the sta stairs up, upstairs and, you know, just um, not easy. <laughs> and I was having some difficulty with feeling like this is a safe environment. Even though my mind is like, these are all really awesome people practicing in the Dhamma. Uh, we're at a children's camp way up. There's probably no bad people coming in or bears, polar bears or whatever to, to maul us. You know, it's intellectually one thing lying on that bottom bunk in the corner with the 
light that said exit in a language I didn't couldn't read. Um, you know, it that's not what my body said. So there were nights that I would lie there in terror. You know, this is a meditation retreat. Sometimes this happens. The stuff comes up. So I would have this fear, 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 and I sat there, lay there. I lay there in pretty much near paralysis. Now, could not move the body and thought, this is terror. This, the, the heart, the throat, the belly, under the arms, all of these sensations, this is terror. Now, it was, some of those images like the sea and those kind of things came up for me. And I didn't follow the images in particular, just the sensation of it. I was able to know that I was in a bunk or I was in a half sleep state or I was, you know, I, was, I had some mooring to the present. And I knew enough of like, this is the conditions that are unfolding. But I didn't go into the mind state. It was just like, I am going to be brave with terror. And I allowed myself to be terrified. Now, this is something that titrate it. You know, allow yourself to go in, allow yourself to come out, allow yourself to go in, allow yourself to come out. But over several nights, my capacity to just be with the arising of such intense fear became I became capacitated to be with it. I won't say how long it took because it's different people will it will be different. So my amount of number of nights of it um, doesn't really matter. It could be you know gone in a blip for somebody and it could be something that just has to go in and come out, go in and come out. But the, the changeability of it and the capacity to be with it that's what I anchored in. You know, I can be with this. It's horrible. It's draining. It has this impact. And I can come out. And it changes. And, and now the story, and now I'm back in my body. The shaking is happening. Now I can move my body. Now I can get up. Now I can go get a drink of water. Well, that awareness. So you're welcome to share that as just something similar-ish um, as a way to potentially work with it. Thank you. So let's see, how are we? Yeah, we st I think we've got another five minutes or so. Is that right? Um, those in the know? Thank you. Uh, Anya, um, I'd like to share two thoughts about the not psyching off, off and a question about the fear. Um, I, so I do agree uh, relaxation is, uh, helps not slacking off because I believe uh, most of us have, uh, have finite mental energy. Um, so the, well, the opposite of relaxation is agitation and uh, stress or anxiety. Um, I do uh, find myself, if I uh, free up the mental bandwidth, uh, which was occupied with anxiety and stress, I do have more energy into not slacking off. So that's a, a experience I want to share. Um, also about, uh, I think Mary uh, uh, mentioned surrendering uh, and the, the playfulness. Um, someone else mentioned. Um, I I think detachment it really helps with surrendering and uh, playfulness. Uh, that's something I've been practicing myself. I was uh, consciously trying to train my mind to be detached. I think that uh, that's helpful because um, with knowing uh, and with the uh, thinking thinking. The beginning with the end is like, 
oh, if I do slack off, I'll I'll regret. That's not a good feeling. So why not just not slacking off, um, with detachment of the outcome. So either I get to the good result, or I enjoy the journey as a, um, as a fun anyway. And so that's two thoughts I wanna share. And about the fear you mentioned, um. I do have fear or negative emotions sometimes, and the way you mentioned is to embrace this feeling, and eventually you develop more、uh, higher tolerance and capacity. But、uh, how I deal with it is、uh, sur- with, with surrendering and the detachment. For instance, you were in a bunk bed. You mentioned there will be dangerous animals.、Uh, what I tend to think is. Uh, I will just surrender. If I got eaten by a bear, then let it be.、Um, that's a different approach.、Uh, but with that, I think probably I'm avoiding my emotions of fear.、Uh, so those two approaches.、Uh, first one is like、uh, face the emotion and develop the, the, the tolerance. The second is as what as I used to do, just embrace.、Uh, Uh, surrender to whatever outcome,、um, without even facing the emotion. I'd like to know your thought. A lot, a lot of wonderful wisdom in what you just said,、uh, and I'm not going to be able to pull all the pieces out. So I hope people were able to hear because there's a lot there. So I'll focus more on on that ending bit.、Um, Yes, there it can be a pushing away, but if you are in the the awareness and the dhamma, the、um, that quality of well, so I get mauled by a bear. I find I I find that when I'm in the actual throes of the visceral experience, I don't want to go to that mental、uh, aspect of it. I want to bring the the load level down. But where it's really powerful is before. It's going to come up again. The fear is going to come up again. It doesn't it? You know. <laughs> So I will prepare myself.、Um, in in conflict negotiations, there's this thing called the BATNA, the best alternative to the negotiated agreement. Well, we do that with ourselves. We negotiate, you know,、um, so many things, and and so a lot of times we're trying to negotiate this fear that's coming in. Well, if I treat you this way, you'll change in that way. So we do this, and we try to come up with these best alternatives. I can be with you. No, no. I like what you do, and I do this too. Where it's I don't set up what is the best alternative. I say, what's the worst thing that could happen? I could die. Well, I've done that a lot already. You know, if if I'm thinking how many lives I've lived. We're all pretty good, actually, at dying. We just, you know, maybe don't remember it. And so, what is the worst thing that could happen? Well, I die. Well, then that's my practice. Dying is my practice right now. Okay. Well, let me be the best, most relaxed, striving dyer right now. And it loosens it up, and it allows me to、um, weather the fear, because it's not the worst. It, you know, I, I can do this. This is just fear. You know, what's it gonna do? Kill me? Great, bring it on. You know, and and that playful kind of quality that's very serious. The detachment is very very serious and very powerful. When you've got enough、um, dhamma stability, that's the way to go. It's very good, very powerful. And、uh, some of these suttas that ha- that I've、uh, I only grabbed this couple lines in the middle, but it leads to、um, I did bring it because it's later in the suttas. It leads to sabasankar rasamato sab pati pa 
pati ni sago tan hakayo virago ni rodo ni balo. And this appears a lot in the suttas, and it's translated as, this is peaceful, this is sublime, namely the calming of all constructions, the letting go of all supports, the extinguishing of craving, dispassion, cessation, nibbana. And the, the, the quality that you're talking about there is that just, just detachment from the clinging, craving, grabbing aspects of it and seeing reality for what it is. I think maybe that's kind of the bottom line of this practice is we're being with reality. And the reality is, could get mauled by a bear. 